from the College by the Lake, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Local, regional, national, and international guests discussing the issues and topics affecting the way you live are on Forum, the North Idaho College Public Forum, with your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. I would like to welcome you to a two-week series that we're going to entitle Historical Milestones in Computer Technology. Uh, we all are living by uh, the work of uh, computers and what they're doing, and, but we on this program want to go back uh, hundreds of years and talk about how technology developed and evolved and what a revolution we've had in the last 30 years in our lives because of the technology of computers. To accomplish this task, we're very pleased to welcome to our program a colleague of ours at North Idaho College. Our guest is Kay Nelson. He is a member of our faculty teaching computer science and he is highly qualified to address the subject and Kay, it was kind of you to come and spend these two weeks with us and share with our viewers a historical look uh, at this development and also we hope near the end of the second program to move towards the future and what we might anticipate as this uh, technology goes so rapidly uh, into uh, more sophisticated uh, possibilities and thank you for being on our program. Thank you very much for asking me. This is um, kind of exciting. Um, I feel as though that uh, we're just going to conduct this as if I was on center stage in the classroom and uh, uh, hopefully this will be very interesting for everybody. We'll just invite our audience from around the Northwest and in Canada to join you in the classroom and as always I'm very pleased to have our two regular panelists. First of all, Janelle Burke who is an attorney in the state of Idaho and a law clerk to a judge in the first judicial district of our state. And next to her is Steve Schink, who is the Dean of College Relations and Development at North Idaho College. And I shall ask Janelle Burt to commence today's questioning. Well, this is a very interesting subject, Kay, ever since I've known you, which has been a good long time. Uh, you've been involved in some aspect of the computer field. Well, how did computers first start? What did man have to accomplish first before he could begin to develop computers? Good question, Janelle. I, I think we've got to go back a couple of thousand years. Maybe we better go back even more than that. Um, if we use computers to be able to handle information that becomes usable to us, then perhaps maybe we can go back several thousand years to be able to see what has been our quest. And I think that what we're going to discover here is that it has taken several thousand years to finally get to the point that where we man has built a machine that could process in a wide variety of information and I think that maybe some of the discoveries along the way become interesting surprises. Um, so whenever you folks are ready we'll go for it. Okay, let's, let's do that. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about the first ones. Okay, let's go clear back to like about 3000 BC and we can see how people uh, handled information and what they did. We go back to 3000 BC and the very first writing system got created and it was created by the Sumerians. Uh, they call it cuneiform. Uh, we fast forward to about 400 years beyond that. The Egyptians figured out how to create the very first form of paper in ink. Uh, they had a quest to be able to write something down and to remember that which they have created. We fast forward another 600 uh, centuries or 600 years and the very first alphabet was created by the Phoenicians. Uh, it wasn't in the form of what we know of today. No, that happened a few hundred years later than that. Uh, somewhere around and about all oh, the, the neighborhood of 1800 BC, we find that the Greeks added vowels. Everything was a constant at, up, up until that point. So the Greeks added vowels at about 1800 BC. That gave us a, a little more of a perspective as to how we can create a written language. Around 1500 BC, well then finally the Romans got into it and they added, created the alphabet as we know of it today. Um, so we, basically what you're saying is all of that was organization. It was all organization. And, and we were laying the form for organization. Yes, we were. Uh, around 100 AD, well then finally the Chinese made paper from rags. Uh, up to that point, uh, the Egyptians made their paper out of a papyrus, uh, pounded the weeds together or the grass together, formed kind of a paper, then finally it was the Chinese who figured out how to take and come up with a process of how we make paper today. 
making it out of fiber and rags and this sort of thing. So now, what do we, what do we, what do, we do that with this information? How do we dispense with it? Um, if we take a look at the, what we call the mechanical age, that was when people finally got into, let's see if we can't get a machine to then process the information. That probably was somewhere around the area of 1400 A.D. to or like around, oh, 18, the middle 1800s in that neck of the woods. If we go back to, to a time prior to that, knowledge was chained. We, they call it chained knowledge. The only people who had information were the very wealthy or the very educated people. Books were physically chained to the shelves of libraries. And so if you wanted the privileged few to get your hands on that, well then you could go into the library and the chain was just long enough to lift the book off of the shelf, lay it on a little counter, and then you could open the book up and you could stay there and tell somebody told you it was time to go home. And then you put the book back onto the shelf and uh, came back another day. And let me interrupt and say, that might be the only copy of that that existed. That was it. That was it. If there was a copy, well then it was the monks or the monasteries who reproduced it and chained it to yet another library. So people always had a quest, well, gee, I would like to be able to know, you know about a piece of information that wants to know something, and they couldn't get their hands on it unless it was a chain. So consequently, what we see today, our, our modern-day computers have broken the chains. We can get information in a way that uh, our forefathers and mothers never, never thought was possible. In... Um, in about the mid-1400s, there was a person that, uh, that a lot of historians know. Uh, his name was Johann Gutenberg from Munz, Germany. And he produced the very first printing press. Uh, he, he decided that um, the common people needed to have a way of having information. And so it was the printing press that put, <coughs> put books, manuscripts, whatever it is, in the hands of the people. Of course, we all know that the history of that was the Bible was one of the very first uh, documents to be put into the hands of people, but then other people uh, said, this is a great invention, so uh, that was done. In about the middle of 1600s, a person by the name of William Ottred, who was an English clergyman, uh, produced the slide rule. And the slide rule was a little gimmick or a little gadget that lets you do mathematics by sliding a little uh, portion up and down a piece of wood that had markings and numbers on it, and uh, and it was very quite accurate, uh, but not 100% accurate. And so, um, the slide rule well, I can remember when when I went the first went to college. Well, then all the engineers had those things strapped to their waist, and that's how they did their computations. Um, in about the middle 1600s, there was a uh, French mathematician called Blaise Pascal, and he, or uh, uh, Blaise Pascaline is what his name was, he, he produced what is for, what we know as a very first mechanical commute, computing machine, and it could add and subtract. It could not do multiplication, uh, or it could not do division, but it could, at least it could do add and subtract. Uh, any mathematician, uh, you know, that knows a little bit about the math could, will know that, well, how do, you do how do you do division? Well, you do a multiple of subtracts. How can you do multiplication? Well, you do a series of adds. And so if you, at least you could do adds and subtracts, well, then uh, you were at least in the ballpark. In about the early 1880s, there was another person that we need to, to address. His name was Charles Babbage. He was an Englishman, an English uh, mathematician. He produced a couple of machines, uh, kind of small. One of them ran by a little hand crank. It was called the analytic or the differential engine. And what it did is that it could simply do math by doing the squares and the cubes of numbers. Once he learned how to do that, he could then progress into the world of logarithms. Why was he interested in doing that? Well, 
mathematicians, one of their primary job was to create navigational tables for ships. And without those tables and without the accuracy of those tables, well, then sailors would find themselves adrift at sea or they would crash their ships on some rocky shoal. And that wasn't, you know, a very pleasant experience. Uh, the problem that they had is that all of the math was done by hand. And so Charles Babbage thought, thought well, let's produce a machine that would do that. It might would be noteworthy here to to talk a little bit about another person that came into Charles Babbage's life, a young woman in her early 20s by the name of Ada Augusta Bryan. She was the daughter of Lord Bryan, who was a good close friend of Charles Babbage. The two became acquainted, and they, and they had a relationship that was purely from an, one intellectual mind to another intellectual mind. There was not a boy-girl relationship here. This, this young woman was totally fascinated by Charles Babbage's work and his quest to be able to produce a machine that could do a multiple uh, areas of, of uh, mathematics and functions. She now goes down in history as being the world's first computer programmer. She, she wrote programs, instructions to a machine that didn't even exist. Her mind was so brilliant that she envisioned how this could be. Consequently, Charles Babbage has been called by many historians as the father of all computers. The second machine that he produced called the analytical um, uh, engine is the same basis by which all modern day computers are based upon. It had the ability to hold the numbers in some kind of a memory bank, to do the math inside of a memory bank, and it could do a multiple of functions. It was never produced. It never existed except on paper. And, but yet, this is the same concept and the same principle by, by which modern day computers have been produced. It's even more phenomenal when we think of then <coughs> Lady uh, uh, Bryan herself was writing a computer program for something that didn't exist. And that happened in the early 1800s. In the late 1800s, we now find that data processing starts to exist. And it existed in the most unusual form. There was a man by the name of Herman Hollerith, and he was commissioned by the U.S. Census Bureau to come up with a new way to tabulate the 10-year census. He used an old invention that went back to the days of a person whose name was uh, Jacquard, and he was a person who used punch cards to make a, a machine to weave cloth, put holes into the card, and the needles of the machine was then either passed through the hole, and he could produce any pattern on any cloth that you wanted to. So Herman Hollerith says, wonderful. Let's see if we cannot then get a machine to do add, multiply, divide, and subtract to be able to do tabulation. So he produced the world's first punch card data processing and used it to use the tabulation for the 1890 census. He, he broke from the US Census Bureau and created a little company called the American Tabulating Company. And he, he joined as a partner, a young man by the name of James Watson. And the two got this little company going. In the middle eight, eight, or about the middle 1920s, uh, about 1924, 25, Herman Hollerith says, it's time for me to retire. I'm out of here. I'm going to need to go and go fishing and play golf or do whatever he was going to do. And he sold his share to this <laughs> James Watson fellow. Watson renamed the company. And he called it the International Business Machines Company. We call it IBM. IBM used the punch card technology for data processing didn't know anything about computers, but then computers had not been created by then. 
So IBM became very large and very wealthy, and it, and it produced one of the, the world's largest companies to do data processing using punch card technology. So now we're going to work our way down to the 1930s. There were a couple of people. There was a person here in the United States called John, Dr. John Atanasoff. And he created a sort of a little computing machine called the ABC. Sort of worked, sort of didn't work. <laughs> Fortunately for the entire world, there was a, an event that took place over in Germany in the late 1930s. There was a young man by the name of Konrad Zusa. He built a machine that acted and worked just like a computer. He used telephone relay switches to make it go. He had his entire family build the thing inside of their kitchen. And it worked, and it worked very well. He went to the German high command, the German government, and he said, we think that we can make this thing go, and it will, and it will produce a phenomenal level of technology that could be used in the war effort. And fortunately for us, and this is, at least this is my opinion, the German high command said, we don't need that machine because in two years we will be masters and rulers of the entire universe, the Earth. We will own it. We don't need this thing called a computer. So it's set. And they had an awfully good idea. What they envisioned was that this thing, this thing called a vacuum tube could be used. Well, over in the United States, there was a couple of young mathematicians who also had the same dream. Um, the, a guy by the name of Eckert and a guy by the name of Mockley. They were, were young professors at the University of Pennsylvania, the Moore School of Engineering. And they put together what was going to be known as the world's first electronic digital computer. And it worked. And it was called ENIAC. And it was big. It occupied, it would have filled your, our houses. If the average house in Coeur d'Alene was 1,500 square feet, if, that was, if that's kind of true, it would fill that entire house. It had over 18,000 vacuum tubes. And I've got a vacuum, so I've got some vacuum tubes here so to, to look at. Yeah, well, so let's uh, go through we'll, this. And, okay. And Steve has some questions he wants to okay. ask. Let's stop right here and let you uh, take us through some of these. Okay. So we, while we have on this show, next week we'll do other things. Let's but take a look here. Yes. Here's this one is one from that uh, period that you're this talking about. This is one like one from one of these periods. This was one of the more larger ones, and then on the tabletop I've got one of the smaller ones. They had vacuum tubes of all sizes. In that same computer. In that same computer. And, and I have been fortunate enough to be back at the uh, Smithsonian Institute, the, uh, uh, the U.S. history, and I've seen part of the ENIAC. The part of it is still existing up in the University of Pennsylvania. Part of it's down in the Smithsonian. And David Mann, one of the instructors of computer science, who just came back from a conference in, at, in Arizona, and, and he saw another chunk of it. And it still works. It's large enough to go many places. <laughs> yeah, it's large. It's huge. Yeah. Uh, Could you show us the small tube there, too? That, 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 that was in the same uh, computer. That same era. Here's one of the smaller ones. They used this as a switch as an electronic switch. Fascinating. Not very big. The, uh, the problem with vacuum tubes is that it has a tendency of burning out. So consequently, when they turned the machine on, it drew enough electrical power that people who lived in South Philadelphia claimed that the lights in the immediate district dimmed. <laughs> It would, it would take two 10-digit numbers, and it would like about six to eight milliseconds. It would compute, add, multiply, divide, or subtract. It was, it was used predominantly. Why it was built? It was commissioned by the armed forces. They wanted to use this machine to compute 
bombing and artillery trajectory shell tables. All of these tables had to be produced by hand. The people who put those together were predominantly women, young women who were graduates of schools of mathematics. Why didn't the guys do this? Because they were in uniform off someplace else. So they simply said, well, lady mathematicians can do this equally as good, and they were available. So this thing wasn't really put together until 1945, towards the end of the war. So consequently, it wasn't ever used to its fullest capacity. But, but it did get some use. I'm going to interject and let Steve move us into the next Well, one. and I know there, there are another, another few milestones along the highway of, of computer development, but there's something you said quite a little bit earlier that really fascinated me, and I, and I need to check my notes. It was, I think, um, Charles Babbage, you said, came up with the principle upon which all computers are still operated. Could you explain that a little bit more? What, what did he hit upon that we're still using today? Okay. Modern day computers has the ability to store in its memory the program that operates on the data. Modern day computers has the ability to hold the data in its own memory. So it becomes a combined effort. So Charles Babbage conceived that a machine could be built that rather than, rather than the human plugging in or typing in or entering in each time that you wanted the, the thing to operate, the program or the series of steps, well, why don't you get it into the computer's memory to begin with and then let the machine on its own go through the steps that does the computation. The fascinating part of this is, I, I think I've mentioned this before, is that the machine was never built. But the blueprints went down in history and were used by modern day computer builders, clear, clear from, mm -hmm. from Conrad Zusa to Jonathan Tanazov to Eckert and Mockley. They also used those blueprints to be able to conceive that such a machine really could exist. And so this became, becomes the basis by which modern day computers actually operate. So, so with what Babbage came up with was more than just, just pure philosophy. He didn't just say, you know, instead of me sitting here thinking, I wish I had a machine that would think. He took it another step and he actually designed uh, what? Were they, were they switches? Were they... Were they uh, used, uh, at, at that particular moment in time, it was using wheels and pulleys to be able to do this. Like gears, that's, and in his days, that's all that he could envision. He couldn't conceive that an electrical switch could exist. Okay, on the next show, we're going to go into modern computers and in the future. We're running a little bit short on time, and I don't want our viewers to go away without getting the rest of the history of the 1950s and 60s. Could you take us through um, th those stages to get us up to real recent times for next week? Yes, I can. Eckert and Mockley quickly left the University of Pennsylvania, formed their own company, and tried to duplicate what they did to build a, com a computer that could be sold to anybody who wanted to buy one rather than just the military. They didn't make it because they ran out of money. They sold their, com their rights to their computer and their effort to a company called Remington Rand. And that was very successful, and the computer was called Univac. And that was in the 1950s. And that was in the 1950s. <clears throat> uh, it wasn't the very first successful computer, though. Over in England, the Lions Company, who was a retail merchandiser, built a little computer or a big computer to do data processing and business called Leo. So that happens a few months before Univac. Univac becomes worldwide famous. And I know, Tony, you're going to appreciate this. You're in politics. Here's what they used this machine for, the first time ever. They wrote a program to predict the outcome of the presidential election in 1952. And I was going to interrupt, so I'm glad you didn't say 1948. <laughs> <laughs> well, two candidates was General Eisenhower and Adlai Stevenson. With less than 7% of the vote being counted, this computer 
predicted that General Eisenhower was going to win by a landslide. Uh, they had TV cameras on this whole effort. They had radio. Uh, and when the results came out of the computer, they didn't release it until the following morning because it was so bizarre. Because at that point in time, everybody in the whole wide world thought that it was going to be a very, very close race. It could be few percentile. Okay? So when General Eisenhower wins by a landslide, they simply said, no way. Well, the following day, headlines all around the world. So they've been using it ever since, and the, and the projections in yes. primaries and general elections yes. have been really quite accurate. Ulti and then we fast forward into the space age. Um, in the early 1960s, suddenly the Russians put up Sputnik. And President um, uh, Kennedy said, whoa, wait a minute. The United States needs to better that better than that, so we got into a whole new realm of different kinds of technology. The very first technology is something which we call magnetic core. What you see right here, this, these are thousands of little teeny tiny donut rings made out of, of metal, and you mix a switch out of it. We fast forward a few more years, and suddenly we use a technology that the world can't understand, I still can't understand it. What you see here is a chunk of silicone. Basically, what silicone is is sand, the stuff that we see out on the beach. When you purify it, you get an ingot. You take a diamond saw and you saw wafers from this. You use a chemical and a photography process to <coughs> etch onto the surface of the silicone an entire electronic circuit, and we call that an integrated circuit. This is what the process produces. Here I have an example of one of those silicone chips. So now, rather than the vacuum tubes that you can see on the table, you're down to this little. Now we're down to this. I've got to notice that we're out of time. Okay. But the good news for the viewers is you'll be back with us next week. We'll pick yes. up at this point and look at a few more uh, items that you have about the modern computer, talk about what it does today and going into the future. Ladies and gentlemen, we wish you'll be with us next week that when we will continue to discuss uh, computers and what's happening now and in the future. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. The North Idaho College Public Forum was videotaped live from the studios of instructional technology on the campus of North Idaho College for viewing at this more appropriate time. We invite you to join us again next week for another all-new edition of the North Idaho College Public Forum on this public television station. From the College by the Lake, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Local, regional, national, and international guests discussing the issues and topics affecting the way you live are on Forum, the North Idaho College Public Forum, with your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. Today I want to welcome you back to part two of a program entitled Historical Milestones in Computer Technology. For any of our viewers who were not with us last week, our guest was uh, most eloquent in presenting the history of uh, uh, technology of different types and uh, how we moved from 3000 BC up until the 1980s in dealing with all kind of uh, the pre-mechanical age, the mechanical age, and all the way up through computers. 
And so we're very happy to have him back this week. Our guest is Kay Nelson, who is a member of the faculty at North Idaho College, teaching in computer science. And Kay, I want to say to you, that was just fascinating last week, how that you brought us through all of those periods. And I was particularly impressed with the number of women and men who've been involved with these questions of technology and advancement through time. And in a moment, the panel will be taking us through their questions uh, and you uh, to the, the modern time, what we're doing. But again, welcome back to the program. Thank you very much. I just want to say, Tony, that, uh, that uh, you and uh, Janelle and Steve are great students <laughs> because you came back for, for one more lesson. And I have a real belief that a lot of our viewers are back from last week, too, to enjoy your expertise. And I do welcome, as always, our regular panel, Janelle Burke, who is an attorney in the state of Idaho. And next to her is Steve Sheik, the Dean of College Relations and Development of Idaho College. And we'll get right into the program with Janelle uh, Burke asking the first question. Well, last, year, last week we went through a number of uh, the uh, processes and steps that, were, that have taken place in, in the process of becoming computer literate. Um, and one of the things that we talked about was how the very first computers were huge. They covered many square feet, 1,500 square feet, some of them, and they had huge um, uh, parts inside. Uh, can you tell us some about that and then bring us right on into the 1960s and 1970s through UNIVAC? Yes, I can. So in, in, again, in 1945, the world's first successful electronic digital computer, the ENIAC, was produced. And it was big. Uh, we'd mentioned that it covered about 1,500 square feet, had over 18,000 vacuum tubes, uh, and it could add, multiply, or divide two numbers together at a, a, a good speed. Uh, what followed on that within the next five or six years, the, the computers got smaller, more reliable. Uh, the UNIVAC in the United States was produced by Remington Rand in the early 1950s. Uh, what happened next is that the computers simply got faster, uh, lesser expensive, more reliable. And then in the early 1960s, a, a most unique invention was created to build the internal makings of a computer, that which we call integrated circuits made out of silicone chips. And that was a space age necessity. In order for the United States to launch rockets into the air and to build jet airplanes that could go faster and faster, uh, then the, the electronics had to be smaller, be mass produced, be more reliable. Uh, and so the silicone chip technology came into being. A, a, a most important milestone happened in the mid-1960s. Specifically, in 1964, the IBM company produced an entire line of mainframe computers using the silicone chip technology. And I have one of the circuit boards to be able to show you what that was all about. So here is one of what, what we can do here. This circuit board, if we were to go back from 1964, even 10 years prior to that time, this probably would occupy maybe two or three refrigerators size of circuits. So this is a very, very powerful little circuit. Uh, it's designed to fit inside of a personal computer, but it was also very representative of what happened in the world of mainframes in 1964. Uh, in, 19, in 1964, when those computers were announced, Within a year, IBM now controlled and marketed over 60% of the world's business in computers. Their stock exploded on the, on the New York Stock Exchange. They became known as Baby Blue. It was probably the premier blue chip stock. So they called them Baby Blue. What happened ne next as a milestone happened in the early 1970s. A young, brilliant engineer by the name of Ted Huff, who worked for the Bell Laboratories at AT&T, took the central processing unit of a computer. And he figured out how to put that on a single silicone chip. And I have an example of that also. It's so small we can hardly see it. <laughs> it's, so small, it's so small you can hardly see it. The actual circuit is one quarter inch square and all encased 
in this little capsule. Here's the entire <coughs> CPU, the brains of a computer, that could now be mass-produced and marketed. So what's the big deal? A computer could be made as small, small enough to fit on your desktop. There was a company by the name of Heath who built all different kinds of kits for components, radios, TVs, you name it. They marketed a little computer called the Altar, and it sold for $500. And everybody wanted one, but nobody knew what to do with it. <laughs> but it was a computer. <laughs> this set off a chain reaction of electronic freaks around this country, if not the world. Everybody wanted a computer. And everybody figured out, well, if Heath can build one, we can build one. And so what sprung up all over the United States, and it started down in San Francisco in the Cal Palace, computer fairs. And tens of thousands peop of people flocked to those little fairs to buy and sell and see the latest gizmo. And did they come? There's a couple of young guys down in the Silicon Valley in lower San Francisco that we need to talk about for just a minute. Named by the name of Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. And they were boyhood friends. And they were electronic freaks. Their very first adventure was to build this little box that you could hook up to a telephone and you could make free long distance phone calls. <laughs> well, obviously, the telephone companies didn't think very, this was a great idea and told the two Steves, go build something else and do something else with your brains. <laughs> and build they did. They put together a little computer. And it was very successful. And they sold it at the very next uh, uh, computer fair in, down in downtown San Francisco. But they didn't know how to market it. They said, let's sell it. Wozniak could have cared less whether they sold the computer. Job says, yeah, I think we can sell this thing. I don't know how to do it. An ex-IBMer by the name of Mike Markula joined their forces, and he took his management expertise and showed them how to build a company. And in 1979, the Apple Computer Company was born. And for the first time, we are now having mass-produced computers that are small, and cheap enough for you and I to buy. And buy, people did. Well, what was happening with Baby Blue, IBM? They had a slight adventure into personal computers, was not successful. But in 1980, they got it all together, and another milestone got created. Because we, we've got to remember that IBM was a controller of 60% of the computer business around the world. So whatever IBM said that it was OK for computers, then the world followed along. Well, here came the very first personal computer. And they call it the IBM PC. Very, very successful. Well, what happened is that around this world, all the computer freaks said, let's build software to work on this computer. A little software program company got started, and it is now the largest software company in the world, Microsoft. They almost didn't make it. In, in fact, IBM really wanted to hire a couple of guys who had a little um, company by the name of CPM to write their operating system. These guys forgot to show up to IBM for the meeting to sign the contract. And it kind of ticked IBM off. One of the fellows said, I know a young man out in Seattle by the name of Bill Gates. Let's call him up. And within a couple of, within days, about two days, it's my understanding that Bill Gates and Paul Allen were on that airplane so fast. And over to IBM they went. And what came out of those meetings was a multi-million dollar contract to produce the operating system for the IBM PC. Well, but, I, but Bill Gates and Paul Allen were intelligent enough and had a good enough attorney that said, 
retain the right to continue producing your own software. So they called it Microsoft. And of course, we all know where Microsoft and Bill Gates and Paul Allen are. You know, they're, Bill Gates is the, probably the, the richest young man in the world. And, and Paul that Allen brings right. us up to the famous 1995 Windows. And so yes, it does. We're going to go on to, to Steve Schink and move from there. Okay, it, it seems to me that as we trace the development or the evolution of the computer uh, over time, that, it, that the ability has almost preceded the use. It, it's not as though there were some demand there that, that, that someone invented a machine to fill. That They invented the machine and then the demand followed. Tell us a little bit about the, the sort of a sea change that took place when, uh, when IBM was making huge computers, uh, not, not room-sized computers like Univac, but, but they dominated the business machine market, and, and then the advent of the, of the personal computer. What, what, was, what were people doing with those big IBM system computers at that time? The, the, the traditional things of uh, the accounting function mm -hmm. um, was predo the predominant, predominant use. Uh, other uses kind of followed in on the heels. There was research centers that were designing and using computers to design component parts. Obviously because of the silicone chip technology, uh, computers being used to produce that. So that, that's where the mainframe world was at. Everybody thought if you really wanted to do serious data processing and computing, mainframe computers. And at that same time, in the average office in this country, um, um, people were still using typewriters. They were probably sure. IBM Selectrics so, with correcting yeah. features. Sure. And when they had the crunch numbers, they had a, a calculator or something else. But then the PC came along. The PC came along. And the PC changed that. And it changed it rather dramatically. The, the little IBM PC in the early 1980s started a catastrophic, not a catastrophic, um, a, a subculture around the world of producing computers small enough to sit on the desktop. Now, let uh, me stop you for just a second there. Okay. And I think I, we'll lose some people in our audience, I know, because they, they still don't use computers. But most of us have enough familiarity to know what computers are like today. Tell, describe that, that personal computer in, in the late 70s and 80s. What kind of capability did it have? And contrast that to what we've got today on okay. our desks. It had the ability to do a little bit of word processing. We could do electronic spreadsheets. We mm -hmm. could run database. We had uh, word processing. Most of the major office type functions we could do, as well as programs for the accounting. So it could do almost as much as a mainframe, but not with the same capability. Mm -hmm. That was about to change, though. And, it, and, and what happened is that in the mid-1980s, specifically in 1984, a brand new personal computer was produced. And it was called Macintosh. It was produced by the Apple Computer Company, Jobs and Wozniak. They put together what the world really knows as the very first successful use of a computer that could use this little device called a mouse. And a mouse is a little device that you can roll it around on the tabletop and as you roll it around then a little pointing arrow on the screen can be used to select processing functions. And it used a little, a little uh, uh, user interface on the windows called, uh, on the screen called Windows. What most people don't know is that Jobs and Wozniak did not develop that. In the early 1970s, a fellow by the name of Doug Engelbart, who was a professor of computer science at Stanford University, produced the first mouse. And I can remember that. And we all said, big deal. So what can you do with it? Nothing. And the world stood still. Another person by the name of Ivan Sutherland produces the very first graphics program called Sketchpad. And I can remember that. And we said, big deal. What can you do with it? Nothing. So Jobs and Wozniak looked at those two technologies and said, I think we know what we can do with this. We're going to make a computer that's finally friendly, 
Uh, that's, I want to stop you again there because I can remember my first personal computer was a K-Pro. I don't know if they're still around anymore. I'm sure at the time it was a fine machine, but I also remember that if you got a backslash that, was, that should have been a forward slash, you could sit there for hours and hours and hours and not figure out why that doggone thing wouldn't work. Yes. That's what, what the, the, the revolution that, that uh, Macintosh ushered in. Yes. So rather than typing in uh, the commands to the computer, computer off of the keyboard, what we call the command mode, the Macintosh says, point to an icon which represents the command and click the mouse button and let the computer on its own do your bidding. Mm -hmm. So this set a, a, across a, a, a very dramatic event. The, the, the announcement of the Macintosh in 1984 came in the Super Bowl in 1984. And Apple had a very, very, very dramatic Ad. What it was is that you were transformed into a conference room where people were frozen in their seats and ice was dripping off of their faces and their hands. And up on the big screen was a sort of a character like James Watson, the president of IBM, telling everybody in the entire world that we will prevail, that IBM was going to show you the way as to how computers, that we've always have done this, and so follow us. Down the center aisle of this conference room raced a young woman in a track uniform carrying a sledgehammer. Behind her was racing the stormtroopers with guns trying to catch her and stop her. She stops at the, at the stage and slings this sledgehammer through the screen and through the podium, and the whole stage explodes. And the next thing is that it says that the world will never be like 1984, because 1984 will not be 1984, which is a play upon George Orwell's book of 1984, because the Macintosh will show you how to do this friendly like. And it was very successful. Well, within a year, the folks over at Microsoft produces their own version of Windows. Apple took Microsoft to court and tried to sue them. The court said, no, Windows is slightly different than what you see in a Macintosh. And they threw it out of court and said, no lawsuit. So finally, the world of PC compatibles has a mouse and a graphic user inter interface such as what the Macintosh had. And this happens all the way around the world. So consequently, we now have at our fingertips an, um, a, a level of technology that the world has never known or could ever imagine in an entire life. Because suddenly we have personal computers that are more powerful than yesterday's mainframes. And where is it going to stop? I don't know. Such things as virtual reality, the virtual classroom. Uh, uh, people are talking about the internet. Uh, I giggled and laughed I hear like about six months ago because it was a, and, and it was IBM's uh, advertisement. Here, here was a a small group of Catholic nuns who were walking from down to mass at the end of the evening. And in French, they were talking about cruising the internet. And the mother superior was not noting this conversation of the sisters following her very, very closely. And finally, she basically turns and says, well, you show me how to cruise the net, too. You know, and of course, right after mass, OK? K, you had yes. talked between the shows about uh, the history last week and that it, you went over a period of like 5,000 years. And then what's happened in this revolution of computers is only over 30 years. Just incredible difference in time. And because of what you just said in answering Steve's question, let's look a little towards the future. It's, uh, it's quite earth-shaking, but uh, we hear a lot about uh, verbal instruction to computers or graphics as part of the programming. And, and since you truly understand this process and, and, and teach it all the time, share with our view, viewers what they might expect in the next 10 or 20 years. Is the day coming where you don't even need the mouse? Uh, in other words, we, we didn't think those things were possible just a few years ago. Uh, tell us what's going on in research in those areas. 
Have you ever seen a a um, a Star Trek uh, show on TV? Yes. And now it's Star Trek: The Next Generation. Mm -hmm. They talk to their computer, mm -hmm. and the computer talks back. We have that technology right now. Uh, as artificial intelligence. Yes, we have that technology right now. The problem that we have right now is that the vocabulary and the computer's ability to pick up human voice very limited very very limited you have to teach the computer your voice how you speak words so that it can start to understand that the next level of technology I think will happen rather soon to be able to pick up anybody even if you came from Georgia and Alabama or whether you come from Wisconsin or whether you were born in Boston or whether you or even born in and raised in North Idaho. And we all have a different way of saying words. To be able to then produce that level of technology, I think, is our next paradigm. But what I hear you saying is that when we reach that, the classroom where you teach computer science will be revolutionized. You'll always need the experts to bring us through the next stage of development and programming and, and that. But for the average person using this, they'll need to know less uh, to use it in a very comprehensive way. In other words, they will just need to be trained to how they speak to the computer. We will still need to know how to manage and what we do with our information. That's always has been true. And it always will be true. So even though that we can get the technology to get us the information faster, more of it, such as like cruising the internet, uh, touching every computer library in the world, what we do with that information still has to be taught. But, I, but, I, but I, what I'm thinking of is that when the computer can speak back of this artificial intelligence, just becoming sophisticated with verbal communication will be the key to that process. Oh, maybe now I know what you're trying to get yeah. at. You're trying to say that R2D2 of the Star Worlds, yeah. Star, uh, Star Worlds, is, is that a, a possibility? Or, uh, or three C3PO, that little computer? Are we looking at that? I think someday that perhaps we will be there. We already have the technology for surgeons to be able to do surgery a thousand miles away. Totally phenomenal. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the surgeon using cameras and remote control robotic arms can run the arms to do the slicing and the removing and the surgeon can be a long ways away than all that we really need in the operating room is the patient and the attendants. Uh, that's going to happen. Uh, we can also use uh, technology to maybe um, look at look at look at information in totally a different way. Being able to to produce things in a different way. Uh, I'm talking maybe like about virtual reality. Uh, most of us have been to lawn, to see the movie Lawnmower Man. We've been to see the Total Recall those kind of movies that where we project ourselves into a different world. Uh, while that may be at almost the carnival stage right now, we do have leading architects in, who are using that technology to produce the imagery of buildings that have not been built, but the, you can use virtual reality to walk in those buildings and see if it fits. There's something else you said before the show, and then I'll go back to Janelle. We talk about the virtual university, and that's a big... Uh, buzzword these days. Uh, but will the classroom be replaced or will you always need the one-on-one? -on -one? I mean, uh, does technology, even though it's remarkable, have its limits on how we deal with uh, learning and human relationships? I wish I could answer that one fully. Be and the reason why I say that is that some students can learn through distance learning. So in other words, uh, like the University of Idaho's telecommunication center uh, over in our library whereby you can sit in the classroom and then watch the, uh, the instructor teaching from Moscow. I think uh, my own personal feeling on that is that some classes can lend itself to that as long as the student is that type of a learner. However, Janelle, you had mentioned uh, uh, earlier that, that you don't like to learn that way. You like to have your hands on. How in the wide world did then we produce the technology of the, of, the, of the teacher being a distance away and the equipment being there with you? And so that there's interreaction of that. 
Uh, I, I think that perhaps maybe that can be done, but that's going to be another level of technology. And uh, for Steve, that's a, another level of expense for mm -hmm. you folks to figure out how do we fund that. Uh, it, but I think it can happen. Janelle Berg. I want to ask a question about what our homes are going to be like in the future and what, how we're going to uh, do our daily activities <coughs> when the world of computers becomes more of a reality. Um, what about storage of information? Will we be storing all kinds of household records and that kind of thing on the computer? We can do that right now, but what Joanna and I are looking forward to that when we have a computer robot that can do our housework. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> that is just a pet. <laughs> we could just eliminate that and maybe someday we will have that level of a robot that can roll around in the middle of the night and tidy things up and then by breakfast time have your meals all cooked and, and ready to go from you. I, I can't wait for that. And we and could, could maybe do our cooking. Uh, yes, it could. Via distance. Yes, it could. Um, it, give the commands uh, for cooking. Uh, how about banking? Yes, we can do Financial that. Financial work. Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, my, my wife, we needed to find a missing check. And we'd need to do this uh, about two or three nights ago. And she was able to access our account in the middle of the night when the doors were closed. And the computer told us, you know, what was the missing check and who had we written it to and what was the amount. That is really wonderful. I also know that we have systems that uh, can do other levels of banking, such as writing your own checks, paying your bills. I'm not sure I'm ready for that one. I want to have a little more close control of, of what happens there. So, so, the, so the world of the, of the future, I'm not sure what we're going to give up. We're going to give up some, some, some freedom there. It can be very scary. Uh, the world of, of the future in computers says that we can have information about you and I that I'm not sure I want other people to have. That brings us into this whole question of security and privacy. And Kay, we'll need to have you back on the program uh, to address that at some future date. On behalf of our panel and our staff uh, at North Idaho College, uh, we thank you as our colleague for coming these thank two you. weeks. And what you've done has been extremely informative. It's just been so exciting to do. Thank you for taking us into the past, through the present, and a look at the future as it deals with the technology of computer science. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I know you've enjoyed these two weeks, and I would invite you to be with us again this next week at the same time, and we'll discuss yet another issue. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart.